they asked me to speak on Greek mythology, which is kind of ironic because one of the terms that historians use is demythologizing. Um, but and one of our bywords is accuracy. So you know, the question is, how does how do these ideas of ac historical accuracy apply to Madeline Miller's Circe? Um, and you know, of course, the first thought is, you look at this who's who in there, and you think, ah, did Circe actually interact with all of these people? Um, and I think that might be the wrong approach to the question. But just to back up, historians are always limited by our sources. And only a fraction of the material that was ever created actually survives. And, you know, it tends to overrepresent cultural elites because that's what survived. And when most of us normal Americans think of ancient Greece, we tend to immediately assume that Athens in the fifth century BC was normative. But the reality is considerably more complex. Uh, for this talk, I looked at a range of material uh, ranging from Homer and Hesiod in the mid seventh century BCE to sources that date from to the late second century CE. So we're talking about a spread of about a thousand years there. And then Homer's epics even re recount events that are supposed to have happened 500 years earlier. So you're talking about a huge span of time. Um, and then, you know, even comparing Homer and Hesiod, who were contemporaries, you know, they had very different audiences, very different styles, um, not to mention distinct dialects of archaic Greek. You know, Homer was a professional bard for aristocratic audiences on the Ionian coast of Asia Minor, which is now Turkey. Um, whereas Hesiod was a shepherd who had a side gig entertaining uh, other peasants in Boeotia. You know, so we can't really expect complete consistency across this kind of a range geographically, temporally. Um, but with those caveats in mind, let's go ahead and proceed. So in order to properly understand Greek mythology, we first have, oh, I, I guess I should probably share this little PowerPoint that I, that I put together for you guys that will, I think, help with some of the you know, more confusing words and things like that. So in order to understand uh, Greek mythology, we first have to understand a few things about the religious context and the realities of these texts. Ancient Greek and Roman writers took uh, what's referred to as a tripartite approach to theoleia, theology. Um, as a brief aside, when school we learned that ology means study of, but the Greek's actually a little more expansive than that. Um, it would mean roughly something along the lines of uh, uh, subject to reasoning and thus one is able to make true statements about a topic. Um, so, is a, so the three types of theology that the ancients talked about uh, were physical, civil, and mythical. Physical theology, uh, you know, is, really refers to philosophy in, as an intellectual pursuit. So it's more akin to what we would generally think of in terms of like academic religious studies and things like that. Civic theology dealt with sort of official priesthoods, uh, publicly supported temples and cults. Oh, and by the way, the term cult is sort of a technical term uh, that really covers any ritual any ritual complex. Uh, so ranging from government supported sacrifices, public games um, and festivals, processions to the private prayers and libations and sacrifices to household gods. So all of that qualifies as cult. Uh, Mythical theology is the one that really probably relates to what we're talking about tonight the most. It's the one that deals with the interaction with the gods, with the divine in literary forms, in artistic forms. Uh, so that would be things like epic poetry, theater, uh, statues, painting, so on and so forth. Uh, the borders of these three categories really pretty fluid. Uh, that's another thing to recognize. So for example, the uh, the variant myths, because all of the myths, there are little variations and things like that, might tell us an awful lot about the civil religion based on where they were composed and things like that. So, uh, you know, the local values might be personified in the heroes and gods, while other characters might represent Xeni, uh, foreigners or they might represent values that are contrary. So 
these things are not at all systematic either. That's the other thing. So the idea that you can have things that really are inconsistent didn't really bother uh, ancient Greeks and Romans much. They, they were fine with that. The, uh, the idea of that kind of systematic thing really comes from a Judeo-Christian framework um, where myth, cult, and theology all have to kind of align and, they're, and then they get uh, reference to a canon of scripture. That didn't exist for the ancient world, for the pre-Christian world anyway. Um, so one of the things about mythical theology is it was obviously popular. Um, it was the subject of a lot of art, a lot of plays, poems have survived. In the Roman period, for example, there were things that were roughly equivalent to sparks notes or cliffs notes uh, with basically so that you could go to a dinner party and not look like a moron if somebody started talking about you know these myths. In fact, those things were so popular that they continued even to, into the Middle Ages. So the Archbishop of, of Thessaloniki of Stathios in the 12th century actually composed uh, kind of a, a commentary guidebook uh, on Homer. Um, but mythical theology was also controversial, at least among the cultural elite. Who knows what the peasantry thought, but at least among the uh, the elites, it, it was it was controversial. Philosophers regularly criticized the myths as unbecoming of the gods because of the way they seem to celebrate immorality and things like that. Um, Plato is one of the few Greeks to actually use the term mythologia, mythology, um, and he used it more or less derisively uh, to refer to something pleasant but totally derivative and you know frankly shallow at best. Um, despite such concerns, very few ancient writers actually rejected the myths outright, um, but they recognized them as a different and generally inferior type of theology, more appropriate for the masses than for the elites. Um, but our approach to myths that they're simply entertaining fictions is actually misguided uh, because there are certain broad patterns in Greek mythology that give, give us little bits and pieces about archaic Greek culture that we probably can't find in other sources. So there are groupings of deities like the Olympians versus the Titans and lesser deities like nymphs who get further broken down into categories like the Oceanids, the Naiads, the Dryads, and so on. Um, then there are also heroes and monsters. Um, one simple explanation of that is that the Olympians represent the gods of the Greek-speaking Bronze Age Indo-Europeans who settled in Greece, while the Titans and others might represent the gods of indigenous populations who were displaced, subdued, conquered, assimilated, that sort of thing. And that assimilation was going both ways. Um, and that would explain regional variations in the myths and presentations of the same god. So sometimes gods get epithets that indicate a particular place. Um, and we see similar patterns in mythologies across the Indo-European cultures. So with the Norse, you've got the Isir and the Vanya, um, Devas and Asuras and Hindu and uh, pre-Zoroastrian Persian mythologies. Uh, gender is an important aspect to all of this, especially where the figure of Circe is concerned, especially in Miller highlights it quite a lot. Um, so Miller also emphasizes that the nymphs are pretty low in the, on the hierarchy of gods. Um, and to understand that nymphs were usually associated with very local concerns, specific mountains, particular streams, specific forests, or, or even a grove of trees, um, that kind of thing. They're also sometimes associated with natural, certain very specific localized natural phenomena, like a particular type of wave, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I would suggest to you that the various nymphs were actually probably objects of indigenous, local, tribal, or clan cults that got incorporated into the broader Greek mythological corpus, you know, as Greeks moved in and interacted with the indigenous populations. Um, and, you know, in some cases, those those nymphs got conflated with, you know, the Greek gods. In some cases, they didn't. Um, and so that's what I would say about all of that. In my work, when I deal with mythology, my concern isn't really about teasing out the historically accurate bits, like whether or not Odysseus was a real king in Ithaca 
that's not really relevant to what I do because what I work in is I work in a field called cultural history. So mythology matters primarily because it reveals a culture's phronema. Phronema is a word that really is hard to translate from the Greek into English. Uh, mindset is, or paradigm, you know, they, they kind of work, but phronema is, uh, the, it encompasses intellectual culture as well as attitude, values, social norms, aspirations, priorities, all of those things. So that's a really important deal. Um, so according to the framework that I'm that I use as a historian, mythology is valuable precisely because it tells us about the phronema of the of the people creating it. It reflects what is true, not because it's historically accurate or scientifically accurate, but because it's true in this sort of cultural sense in a uh, in terms of conveying values and attitudes and priorities, those sorts of things. Um, so make no mistake, we have our mythology too. Um, you know, you start just thinking about, you know, American movie tropes, right? The plucky underdog who succeeds against the odds by, you know, basically determination and hard work, you know, the solitary hero who saves the vulnerable in the town from the bad guys, you know, single, by single-handedly fighting, you know, the heroine of a Hallmark movie, movie channel, uh, or channel, Hallmark movie, who goes to her hometown to save the family business before Christmas, only to fall in love with one of like three archetypal uh, guys who ends up proposing marriage at the end, right? So what are these, you know, so these are also reflecting our values, right? The values of rugged independence, uh, retributive justice, individualism, nostalgia, romance rather than relationship, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, so the myths of the Greeks and Romans likewise reflected their front of them in ways that might be a little alien to us. For example, they accepted notions of uh, hierarchy, of gender roles, uh, codes of hospitality that would seem just weird to us, but they were completely normative to them, so much so that they often didn't even have to comment on them. It's just there. Um, so in Greco-Roman mythology, the figure of Circe is really complicated. Um, although Madeline Miller suggests that her name comes from this word kirkos, right here, meaning hawk. Uh, more likely it comes from this word here, kirko. Uh, which means to secure with rings, to encircle. Um, and this word kirko, actually, it's kind of interesting. About the only time it ever actually got used was in a play by Aeschylus called Prometheus Bound. Um, and of course, the binding of Prometheus features very heavily in here. So I suspect Miller, you know, had discovered this as well. Um, but she went with the kirki, meaning coming from Kirikos, meaning bird. Uh, she's described as the daughter of Helios, that is to say the daughter of the sun. Um, by the way, daughter of the sun is a really killer song by a, this band out of Toronto called Blood Ceremony, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, different authors give different attributions as to who her mother might have been. Miller follows Homer, calling her the daughter of, uh, a daughter of the Oceanid Percy. Um, while Hesiod uses a slight variation on the same name, Perses. Uh, Diodorus Siculus, which just means Diodorus of Sicily, um, asserts that she was actually the daughter of Aetes and Hecate, Aetes being her brother in Hesiod and Homer and so on, um, Hecate being a goddess of magic. Um, and according to uh, the way Diodorus develops it, Circe is actually the sister of Medea. Um, but be that as it may, so she has various, there's some slight variations in terms of who, how her family plays out. Um, I said earlier that nymphs are generally associated with places. Circe is actually associated with this mythical island of Aea. Um, it's in the West. <laughs> you know, whatever that means, near the river ocean, uh, because in the Greek 
idea of the world, there was a giant river that encircled the world and was constantly flowing called the ocean. Um, now, Oceanus was uh, Circe's grandfather, right? Um, but she's in the West where the sun sets while her brother Aetes is in Colchis in the East where the sun rises. So in some versions of these myths, uh, Circe actually originates in Colchis and then moves to Aea. Um, now there are some associations of the West here, putting it in the Tyrrhenian Sea. Uh, the, Tyrrhenian, the term Tyrrhenian was actually a term that was used for Etruscan. So she's associated with the Etruscans and with Italy, basically. Um, so Strabo actually asserts that she, her, her place is Italy itself. Um, a lot of ancient authors give lists of her sons and things like that. So among her sons are the progenitors of and mythical rulers of the Etruscans, the Latins, and she's even in a Latin myth, she and Poseidon have a child called Faunus, who is a god, a god of the wilderness. Ovid mentions that she turns Picus, who is the ruler of Latium, where the Latins are, so in other words, the Romans, or one of the gr related groups to the Romans, who is the son of Saturn. He, supposedly, he turns her, he, she turns him into a woodpecker. Um, and Strabo and Cicero both identify a shrine to Circe at Mount Tirteo in Italy. Kirteo, Kirteo, you know, in other words, it's named for her supposedly. And this is a common thing with ancient writers where they will take something and they'll say, oh, this derives from this. And then they kind of work with it and they expand that. Um, Sometimes you're just making stuff up, honestly. Um, but the association with Aea is pretty strong, but beyond that, you're good luck finding a particular island. Um, so as a goddess, Circe is a goddess of magic and witchcraft. And how much of a distinction there is between magic and witchcraft is difficult to say. Um, so there is an epigram from the eighth century BCE that actually reads, and I've got it here, you know, daughter of Helios, Kirki, the mighty witch, come cast cruel spells, hurt both these men and their handiwork. Now, these epigrams are often like this. They're, they don't give you a lot of context. So whoever wrote it evidently was really mad at two people and wanted Hel Kirki to basically work some magic and punish them, right? That was the deal. Uh, so supposedly, they, were, according to Strabo and Cicero, who were a couple of major writers in the Roman period, there were cult centers in Italy and in the Pharmacusae um, off the south coast of Attica. And Pharmacusae just means which islands. So my guess would be that they were saying, oh, this, this mountain, Cicero, uh, Kirchio, it must come from Kiriki. Ah, which islands? Pharmacuse. Ah, Pharmaca. Polypharmaki. That's one of the terms here for mighty witch. Um, you know, so they must worship Circe. Yeah. Maybe they did, maybe they did. Now, Statius um, comes along and he's, he's a later um, writer. He's writing in the first century of the common era. And he describes a cult in which the Cirrus Monto obeys and weaves the charm wherewith she disperses the shades and calls them back when scattered. Potent, but without offenses. The transmuter, Circe of Colchis in the, uh, in the Aeaean shore, where they pray with sacrifices in honor of their dead ancestors. The What I just read reads a little differently from here. Partly because I was looking at it going, wait, this doesn't, there were some things in there that didn't quite make sense. So I looked at the Latin and modified it a little bit. Uh, and this is actually misspelled. This should be simulatrix, uh, not simulatrix. I left out an A when I wrote this. I'm sorry. Um, and, but this word simulatrix matters. Um, it, I translated it as transmuter. Uh, 
transmutation it being a particular branch of magic that changes shapes. Um, nice thing for all the D&D nerds in the audience. Um, but it derives from a word that makes something resemble something else. But there's a similar word, uh, simultas, which means jealousy or rivalry, um, conflict in a feud, something along those lines. And I think that wordplay actually matters a bit because there's a lot of connection between her and Aphrodite that I came across, um, which sort of surprised me. Um, so for example, Hesiod, is, you know, so that, that connection with something like uh, a feud or revenge fits this epigram, but it also fits with some of the connections with Aphrodite. So for example, Hesiod mentions that Telegonus was, is her son, quote, by Aphrodite's will, unquote. Two other sons are attributed to Odysseus. So I'm not sure what that would actually necessarily mean. Um, her jealous rage against Scylla is connected to Venus, according to Ovid. And Apollonius Rhodios, which is just Apollonius of Rhodes, uh, noted, notes that Circe beckons the Argonauts, quote, in her own seductive way, unquote. And in uh, another writer's work, Valerius Flock, Flaccus, he actually has the goddess Venus appear to Medea in the guise of Circe. Um, all of these things make me think that there is some sort of a strong connection between Circe and Aphrodite Venus. But what that connection is, we, we lack the resources to, you know, the ancient sources don't give us enough to really evaluate that. But I would suggest that there's some sort of a relationship there. Uh, and we know that Aphrodite probably was a foreign fertility goddess that got incorporated into the Greek pantheon. And she's probably a composite figure of multiple uh, fertility goddesses from all over the Eastern Mediterranean. So another thing that comes up is this idea of a mystery cult. So in the mythology, Circe has connections to a mystery cult. The term mysterion, which I have here, um, actually has a number of meanings in Greek. Uh, particularly in reference to sacred rituals, sacred rites, revealed mystical truths, and magical amulets. Mystery cults in the Greco-Roman world were often associated with deities of Eastern origin. And remember, one of the origin myths for Circe is that she originates in Colchis, which is off in the East. If it's even a real place, it's probably somewhere around what is now Azerbaijan. Um, so they were often associated with these Eastern deities and with women, which sometimes led these mystery cults to be suppressed as subversive. Um, not always, depended on the cult, what they were doing and how you know, people thought what they were doing. Um, so anyway, the text of Apollonius Rhodius's Argonautica, which I mentioned earlier, describes the ritual of purification for murder uh, in considerable detail. Uh, for example, they have to sacrifice a suckling piglet to Zeus. Um, and although she purifies Medea and Jason, Circe does refuse Medea hospitality because she's committed the, quote, intolerable sin, unquote, of eloping with a foreign. So that, to in the Argonautica, was just beyond the pale. Uh, you know, she could purify them for, you know, fratricide, but not not marry, not eloping with, with a foreigner. Uh, marrying a Xeno with long hairs. Uh, so Circe's detailed advice to Odysseus, uh, wait, so that he can get into the underworld and back out, so he can appease the shades, as well as to navigate the various dangers, all suggest to me that there might be some mysteria in there. That is, these secret revelations, as well as rituals. So particularly with going into the underworld and back, that also would include some, uh, some necromancy, which comes up in that quotation from Statius about that particular cult in the Theban. Okay, so all of this suggests to me that Circe was likely a local goddess of fertility, magic, and vengeance, and maybe wild animals as well, um, because those come in as well. And she got incorporated into Greek mythology, but exactly where she would have been the local goddess, who knows? Um, she's associated with the West, maybe. 
Um, so anyway, the principal association of Circe in Greek and Roman mythology, though, is with sorcery. And the word for sorcery in Greek is pharmakeia. Uh, pharmakeia is our root for the word pharmacy. Um, until the development of modern medicine, there's really very little distinction between sorcery and, you know, the development of drugs. Um, it's all kind of tied together. And in general, though, the ancient Greeks didn't have, and Romans did not view pharmakia as benign. Um, and certain, certainly Circe was no mere neighborhood pharmacos. She wasn't, you know, you're just neighborhood witch. Um, she discovered many drugs of exceptional potency. So again, turning to Diodorus Siculus, his account is rather notable. Uh, he says, quote, although Circe, also, although Kyrki also, it is said, devoted herself to the devising of all kinds of drugs and discovered roots of all manner of natures and potencies, such as are difficult to credit. Yet notwithstanding that she was taught by her mother Hecate about not a few drugs, she discovered by her own study a far greater number, so that she left to the other woman, that is Hecate, um, no superior superiority whatever in the matter of devising and uses of drugs. She was given in marriage to the king of the Sarmatians, whom some call Scythians. And first she poisoned her husband, and after that, succeeding to the throne, she committed many violent acts against her subjects. For this reason, she was deposed from her throne, and according to some writers of myths, fled to the ocean, where she seized a desert island, and there established herself with the women she, who had fled with her. Though, according to some other historians, she left the Pontos and settled in Italia on a promontory, which to this day bears the name Kirkeon. That's from uh, Theodore Siculus's Library of History. Uh, there are a lot of things that are in there that are kind of interesting that we'll sort of revisit. Uh, and I mentioned Valerius Flaccus hinting at the same tradition when Venus appears at, in the guise of Circe to Medea. And she advises Medea to reject a Sarmatian marriage. Um, so there's something going on there. Um, and Medea is also eponymous for the Medes uh, in basically what's now Iran. Um, so, but what Circe's most closely associated with are these transmutations. Uh, so like the quotation from Statius above mentioned Circe as a simulatrix. She is such a powerful sorcerer that she's even able to uh, transform the nymph and fellow goddess Scylla and Picos, who's the son of Saturn into a woodpecker. Uh, by the way, the Scylla, the name Scylla, uh, a lot of ancient writers saw a connection between the name Scylla yeah. and this word skilax, which means puppy. So you get these things where like Can't puppy teeth it. and puppy dog, they were afraid of getting turned into some sort of monster. Uh, but we all know from the story, the story of Odysseus's sons, or sons, uh, sorry, his men being changed into pigs. In fairness, though, you know, might not have been much of a stretch to change some of those guys into pigs. Anyway, Homer describes Circe as a goddess with beautiful hair, with human speech and strange powers. That human speech thing is something that Madeline Miller draws on to because she says that Circe doesn't have kind of the command voice that goddesses have. She has a human voice, so no one takes her very seriously. Um, I think it was Hermes who makes that comment to her, if I remember correctly in the book. It's been a, it's been a few months since I read Circe, I'm, I have to admit. Um, so the, Homer asserts that the mountain wolves and lions that surrounded her had been subdued by evil drugs. Okay. And so that's this right here. Kaka pharmak. It should be kaka pharmaka, but because, and then a little bit later on, he notes that she fed the men good, th quote, good things with which she had mingled pernicious drugs. That's this pharmaka uh, So pernicious drugs as well to make them forget their own country utterly. Having given them this and waited for them to have their fill, she struck them suddenly with her wand, drove them into the styes where she kept her swine. And now the men in the had the form of swine, the snout and grunt and bristles. Only their minds were left unchanged. Uh, so it's the drugs, the, the drugs didn't transform the men into swine, but it was her wand. The, what the drugs did was they made them forget their own country. 
So they just sort of were hypnotized, I guess. Um, this, the thing that protects Odysseus, of course, is the drug moly. And this word here, moly, is it's a weird word for in Greek. Um, in later Greek, it comes to mean garlic, uh, but what exactly it meant in the epic poetry is hard to say. Um, the construction of the word, the morpheme, this last part, this you here at the end, that is not something you see in Greek. So it's obviously a loan word from someone. Um, it's, you know, now, Pliny the Elder, much later, uh, um, I guess he's first century BC uh, Latin writer, references it as being a plant that has hypnotic properties. Um, and the word doesn't conform to Greek morphemes, as I said, um, but one of the major Greek lexicons uh, suggests that it might be related to a term, uh, which is Sanskrit. Um, referring to the magical use of roots. So it could be something that goes back into like some sort of really early Indo-European language that ended up influencing both Greek and Sanskrit. Hard to say. Um, one of the other things is that in the story, of course, Circe can't help but offer Odysseus genuine hospitality. She orders the various nymphs, the dryads and naiads who, who serve her. Um, to tend to his needs. And of course, she has to sleep with Odyssey and she falls in love with him because, you know, that's how these sorts go. Um, but it also could uh, indicate some of the connections with Aphrodite. Uh, she bears sons as a result. The exact number and identities varies from author to author. Um, Athenaeus of from the second to third century of uh, AD offers a moralistic reading of the transformations, saying, quote, by way of denouncing drunkenness, the poet changes the men who visited Kyrki into lions and wolves because of their self-indulgence, whereas Odysseus is saved because he obeys the admonition of Hermes. In Ovid's telling, the men's restoration happens when they were, when, quote, they were sprinkled with the juice of some strange herb, unquote, and touched on their heads with Circe's wand, which evokes some sort of a rite some sort of mis mystery, those mysteria, um, sacred rites, like, kind of like a baptism. Um, and a lot of mystery cults had baptismal type rites, by the way. Um, there's even a touching story about transformation in Ptolemy Hephaestion's uh, new history from the first or second century that holds that Odysseus returned to Aea at the end of his life and she changed him into a horse, into a horse, so that he could die peacefully of old age with her. Why he had to be a horse to die peacefully of old age on AA? I have no idea, but that was apparently the deal. Um, and Ptolemy asserts that this resolves a difficult line in the original Homeric text, that the sea will send you the softest of deaths, um, which is a little bit for, different from the death at the hands of Telegonus with the spear made of a stingray. So, you know, these things happen. And the, uh, I am going to stop my sharing now. There we go. And so some in ancient authors indicate that the transformations from human to animal form might have been under somewhat incomplete. Even Homer indicates that Odysseus's men retained their human lines, making the transformations even more horrific. Uh, much of the art suggests human bodies with tails and animal heads. Um, Aeschylus in the fifth century BC wrote a now lost play called Circe. And it seems likely that his chorus were half transformed human animal hybrids in place of the usual satyrs. Um, in the Argonautica of Apollonius Rhodius, the Argonauts come upon Circe as she's washing in the sea and quote, a number of creatures whose ill assorted limbs declared them to be neither man nor beast had gathered round her like a great flock of sheep following their shepherd from the fold, unquote. So again, they're neither man nor beast. So there's something there that prevent, that it's not, an it's not like simply, oh, this is an animal now. Um, so all of these disparate appearances of Circe in the Greco-Roman mythology do give us a glimpse of an ancient Greco-Roman phronema. Gods were not to be trifled with. They were not to be ignored lightly. Magic was real, but it was dangerous. Um, 
and perhaps the greatest horror for the ancients in Circe. And I, I only saw this as I was really reading through a lot of these sources, isn't necessarily her jealousy and wrath, although that was terrifying. It wasn't even her transmutations that she could perform. What was really so horrific, so frankly evil about Circe was her inversion of the rules of hospitality. She would invite these people in and then transform them. And the code of hospitality was one of those inviolable things. I mean, Zeus punishes other gods for violating hospitality. Somehow she manages to escape Zeus's wrath for that. And I don't know if there's just, there are just gaps in the mythological cycle that we just don't have all of the material that might have existed at one time but it's there. Another thing that comes through is that female power is often hidden from view. It's treacherous, seductive, and, it, and it's always a threat to the norms of a patriarchal society. Females, even goddesses, remember her conversation with Medea, were to be obedient to their fathers. They weren't fair, free to marry for love, eloping. Oh, no, 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 no. Foreigners, Colchians, Persians, Medes, Etruscans, and so on, were exotic seductive, but they possess strange and dangerous powers. So all of that is there in the mythological corpus. One of the things that Miller does is she rejects a lot of those fundamental things in the ancient Pranana, and she offers us explanations, sort of psychological explanations for Circe and Odysseus's behaviors, for example, that were of no concern to Homer and other ancient writers. So in rejecting that phenomena, what she's done is she has presented a modern phenomena. And that I think will actually tie in with keynote uh, number two, if, based on their title and everything. Um, so I'm just going to leave with a question. What does Miller's reinterpretation and her presentation of Circe say about our phenomena? And with that, I will go ahead and turn things over to Sarah to moderate questions. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Kurt. Let me turn my video on. Great. Okay, well, we do have one, so we'll get started with that. And if any of if the rest of you have questions, please do put them in the chat window. Um, this is from one of our attendees. While um, this person was in university at Liverpool, they were taught that Circe also symbolizes the independence of women and where the independent woman was seen as a witch. Um, this could also be seen through her use of pharmaca. What do you think of this? Oh, Kurt, you are muted. I didn't realize I had muted myself. Okay, I think that's a definite possibility. Um, I am not absolutely certain that she's presented as a witch because she's independent. I think it's more that witchcraft is what get what allows her to be independent um that said she is definitely seen as a threat to the patriarchal norms she's off on that island all alone the only the only beings around her are these with these naiads dryads things like that so she is definitely independent um any males that get there get transformed into animals so i would suggest that there's definitely a connection between that independence and her being a witch. On the other hand, I, I don't know, and even though witches were looked down on, definitely, they're common enough and they're not exclusively female. That's another thing to recognize is that witchcraft is not exclusively female, even in the modern period. I mean, if you look at the, the modern witch craze, the witch hunting craze in Europe and North America, a lot of the people who were killed were male. So drawing too close, too gendered a, a connection there, I think can be a little bit fallacious. But I would say that, yeah, she you can certainly read her as representing female independence and therefore dangerous. Does that answer the question? I'm hoping. <laughs> I think it gave your thoughts, which was where the question was. Um, and if, you know, uh, I 
this is very much your talk, but I would love to shout out that we did have another talk um, that is in our archive about specifically Circe and um, this idea of a witch um, done by Jody Simon, another lecturer at WSU. So anyway, if that's something that interests you, check that out. Okay, what other questions do we have? We have a thank you comment. So, and, and we'll definitely send Kurt um, your comments and things like that so he can see what you were saying. Thank you for the compliment, Cassie, by the way. I'm not sure all of my students would agree. Can you see it? Uh, yeah, the the book is ridiculously uh, respect, uh, expensive. It's a print on demand and academic kind of thing. Uh, I've seen I've seen prices that are considerably lower than three hundred dollars, but uh, I'm not entirely certain what the going rate is at the moment. Uh, we have a question: Are there other goddesses that we might call feminists? Ooh, that's a tough. To some degree. Almost all of the goddesses are feminist in the sense that they violate the human social norms. I think that would be a pretty fair. There are a couple of goddesses who just sort of don't appear a whole lot, like Hestia. You know, she doesn't seem to do a whole lot. Um, but pretty much all of the other goddesses, I would say. They even even Hera, you know, she's she's potent. She's she is tough. She does not want anyone uh, to you know to mess with the rules, and she has the ability to force it. Um, Aphrodite, actually, I would say is really quite feminist. I mean, yeah, she's married to um, Hephaestus, but you know, she sleeps with Ares. As well as some others, um, you know, she has plenty of little dalliances despite being married, um, and she's also she can be brutal. Uh, these these goddesses were not they were not sweet and nice. Um, pretty much any of them. Um, a lot of them are also described. They they don't get male counterparts. Um, Artemis never is never mated to anybody. Um, Athena, in fact, the uh, the best known temple to Athena in Athens, the Parthenon, literally Parthenon means the place of the virgin. So it's Athena Parthenos, Athena the virgin. That was the name of the statue. So in a lot of ways, I would say that, yeah, a lot of the goddesses could be considered to be kind of feminist icons to the extent that there was such a concept of feminism. It's all very, very interesting. Um, okay, and while you were talking, I was looking up the question uh, regarding if anybody currently uh, holds your book right now, and we do not, um, but I am, while Kurt answers the next question, I will um, look and see if it's at the Wichita State University Library. So, um, I, somebody asked me what you thought of Cersei. Kurt, of give us your book? Yes. Or, oh. Oh, the book. Yes, the book. Okay. Yeah, no, I thought it was, I thought it was a perfectly good read. It was, it was an interesting book. Um, you know, it was an enjoyable work. It definitely, you know, it takes a different approach. Um, and there are other books that do similar things where they take a well-known story kind of turn them on their head. You know, I, the first one to come to mind is Grendel. Um, is it Gardner? Is that who wrote that one? I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but anyway, so in so I liked the fact that it really did take these things that were familiar and sort of turn them on their head and raise some of these front of it questions. Uh, there were certain elements in it where it's like, I would have done it differently if I were writing, but I'm a guy, you know, so I probably would have taken a different approach on certain things. Uh, you know, that's, uh, but that's okay. Uh, that's, that's, I think that is true. Like, you know, just that uh, you'll have a different opinion of things because you're seeing it through your perspective um, that Madeline Miller also um, looked at through her lens. So 
Very interesting. Okay, so um, there was a question about hospitality, why it was so important to the gods. Um, and then if you could also just talk a little bit more about that importance, the hospitality and what that all meant. Oh, wow. Uh, so hospitality is one of those things that was hugely important across cultures. Um, certainly it, throughout the Eastern Mediterranean basin where to violate those brought the wrath of the gods down. Um, so for example, the Sodom and Gomorrah story, the sin of Sodom was not sexual. It was actually, uh, it was a lack of hospitality. In ancient Greece, there is a similar story in the sense that, uh, and I don't remember all the details, but I do remember that Zeus and Hermes sort of appear in human form, go into this town looking for hospitality. They're refused. They get no hospitality from the people there. So they leave town and Zeus floods it to punish them. Uh, so it's clearly something that's gigantically important. That's also one of those things that it falls with the domain of Hestia and Vesta, the uh, goddesses of the hearth, the, things like that. And some of it I suspect is you're talking about a world where there were no hotels. So if you were having to travel for whatever reason, you would need a place to stay. And so part of that was food, shelter, a fire, but part of it was also protection because quite literally, and you see this definitely in the mythology, anything outside of civilization was threatening. And in ancient Greece, even going from one, one police to another police, one city to another city was dangerous. You lost, if you were outside of the legal jurisdiction to which you were a citizen, you had no legal protections. You were literally outlaw unless the two cities had sort of a reciprocal agreement. So I, I suspect that that's why hospitality features so prominently. Um, even in George R. R. Martin's uh, Song of Ice and Fire, they reference, he references uh, hospitality throughout, you know, with uh, bread and salt, I think is the uh, phrase that they use, if I remember correctly. And that's why the Red Wedding is so horrifying because the phrase have violated the rules of hospitality of rules that even the Tagarians observed, right? You know, that even predate the old gods, you know, in, in Martin. So Martin kind of captures that. I, I hope that answers the question as best as I can off the top of my head. We had some comments while you were talking. Um, they talk, uh, the laws of hospitality were important in the Macbeth story um, as well. And then uh, it's interesting that the hospitality ethic has survived in Muslim culture rather than in Western culture, since it was just a strong value in Greece. Um, and someone else indicated all of India too. So. Um, yeah, it, it is interesting. Now, I will tell you in Greece, um, especially say 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you probably would have found it a lot more. Uh, Greece has become much more Europeanized. Uh, and again, when I was talking about the phronema, I think part of that is for our phronema, our Western phronema, it's very individualistic. Um, whereas that wasn't, and I don't even think that was necessarily the case throughout Europe before the modern period. So if you go, if you could build a time time machine, I always tell my students that if in a history class that if they build a time machine, they automatically pass. And, you know, they'll get an A if they make it look like a phone booth. Um, and if you could build a time machine, travel back to the 1600s, I think in Europe you would find much more of a sense of that hospitality ethic than you would today. Um, so, yeah, I do think it's something that's just evolved. Um it seems that there was a lot of violence in Miller's depiction of the gods and goddesses. Can you comment on why so much violence was normal? Uh, yeah, vi 
the ancient world was a violent place. Um, and you know, one way of looking at it is, I, I remember fairly recently, I heard somebody talking about envisioning a, a world without prisons, that this is a good thing. I'm a historian. I said, we've had worlds without prisons. We've had that world. Before the, before the Spanish Inquisition, there were no prisons. Your options for punishment were exile, outlawry, corporal punishment, capital punishment. Those are your options. You know, so I think in that sense, there, there is a lot of violence. Um, and I think Miller is also trying to really highlight some of the gender domestic violence kind of elements as well. Um, Homer really emphasizes a lot of violence, the epic poetry there's a lot of like battle violence, right? You know, mano a mano fighting, you know, this kind of thing. And it's celebrated as glorious. So there was actually quite a lot of violence there. Um, there's a lot of violence in the myths. Gods beating up on each other. And, you know, of course, gods can do that and the other gods heal usually, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so I think that that's why there's so much violence in, in the book. Okay. Any other questions? My my dog's name is Zorro. I'm not sure what fighting lions means. I'm guessing it's a reference to gladiatorial events in Rome. That was very violent. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, since we are in nearing the end of our time anyway, um, I'm gonna go ahead and share the uh, link to the survey in our chat window. But if, if we still continue to have questions roll in, um, we still have a few minutes to uh, cover them. So I'm gonna put that in there. But thank you, um, Kurt, this was a really fascinating talk. Uh, the, oh, here's one. Did you ever consider writing your own book concerning mythology? It's never crossed my mind. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it, it's a fascinating concept, although actually my, my next book, assuming I ever get around to getting it written, um, that, that front of my concept is sort of the central element to it. So somebody would be able to at least adapt that for bringing in some mythology or there might be some mythology that would come into a chapter. Great. Oh, and I did, it's for the person who asked about whether um, the book was available at Wichita State, it is not available there either, but I did happen to find it at the Central Baptist Theological Seminary, the Shoemaker Library in Shawnee, Kansas. So that's going to be your, your uh, closest option. If you are interested in um, checking out Kurt's book and don't want to spend $300, um, you can see if we can um, obtain it for you on interlibrary loan. Um, we can definitely try and reach out. Of course, right now, interlibrary loan is a little bit um, touch and go just because we're relying on other libraries being open and offering that service, but um, you're more than welcome to try and we'll, we'll see if we can find it for you. Or you can just borrow it from Kurt. No. <laughs> you're muted. <laughs> They've changed the cover art since, since I, I got I'm going to say, yours is blue. The one I'm looking up is red. red. So. Yeah, yeah. They, they changed it so it would fit into some sort of a, uh, some sort of a series. But yeah, it's not, it, it it's, uh, it's got footnotes in it. So, you yeah. know. <laughs> you can you can read that and it has uh, has a it does have a few things in there the person it's written about wrote a poem called uh it's hard to it's usually called on stupidity um but uh the 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 a better translation would actually be the morons <laughs> it's it's got lines in there like uh you know Alas and woe, where does one flee? You know, there is no cure for stupidity except for death. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's a pity when, so, when a stupid person tries to, to be clever. 
but even worse if they're young and they have power, um, which I think was directed at the emperor. <laughs> so. I'm typing in the title right now for the person that asked. Uh, it looks like I may have missed a question. Um, and you had kind of talked about it a little bit, but what does this book um, say about our current culture? You know, um, not necessarily in relation to hospitality, but, you know, I think that kind of plays into what you were talking about earlier. Yeah, I think I think it does. I think I think this I think anything, you know, one one thing to do is I, I always look at everything as a cultural text, songs, uh, TV shows, books. And I so I'm always thinking, what does this say about us, about our values, about our, you know, ideas? Um, and you can really see like, you know, a few years ago, I started reading all those 19th century Gothic romance, you know, things, you know, the, uh, the Brontes and, you know, so on. And because I had never read them because, you know, I'm a guy. And uh, <laughs> so I ended up reading them and I loved them, but they, they have a very different vision of what romance, what marriage, what relationships mean than we do. Uh, and that's only 150 years. It's not a huge length of time. Um, and even how class comes into play, if you look at an American work compared to a European work, it's just very different. Uh, so I do think that's, that's an interesting thing. Um, and you, if the question was about current books that are really exploring uh, modern culture, there's, there's quite a lot out there. Um, and people are starting to look at things like, wait, what is social media doing to our culture? What would Cersei think about social media? <laughs> I would say she's anti-social media. <laughs> I mean, just the right. fact that she went to the island, kind of locked herself away. You know, I don't think she wanted a lot of, I don't think she really wanted people following her Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> Someone says that she got all her gossip from Hermes. So there you go. It's like having a real bubble, uh, <laughs> the Hermes bubble. A hermetic seal. <laughs> there you go. 